looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another Azuzin session. How about that? So I'm pretty sure you expected that. By uh, at this point, you pretty much expect that. So let's make a little bit of an announcement and uh, officially start the stream as usual. So I'm going to do a red circle live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch.television? Today we're doing OpenGL in pure C. That's right. So I'm going to give the link to Twitch channel where we're doing all of our shenanigans. And we're going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged. And there you go, the stream has been officially started. So today's stream is going to be a continuation of the, uh, of the previous stream, right? So today we're going to continue rendering Voronoi diagram, right? So, and if you never heard about Voronoi diagram, uh, I'm going to give you the link uh, to Wikipedia, right? You could find that link yourself, but I'm going to copy paste it in the chat. And uh, also I'm going to put it in the description for people who's watching on YouTube. So a Voronoi diagram looks like this, right? And it's a pretty simple concept. You have these dots. I personally call them seats. I don't know what's the official terminology for these things, but I like to call them seeds because they sort of, uh, they seed the, the cells, right? Um, and essentially, each of, uh, each of these seeds have an associated color with them. So what we're doing, we are, for each pixel on the image, we uh, find the closest seed to that point, and we color that pixel with the color associated with that seed. Right. And as you can see, we get this very interesting picture that looks uh, kind of organic in a sense, right? It looks like the actual living cells, right? So this is how like an actual living cells would like pack together, uh, you know, like sort of crammed space. So, and that's what makes these uh, sort of diagrams very cool when you render them. And on the previous stream, we actually uh, implemented a very naive algorithm uh, to render this diagram in C. We just rendered it pixel by pixel just to get the gist of what it's all about. Of course, there's a, a lot of like uh, very smart uh, algorithms developed by smart people, uh, right? So you can see these sort of like uh, very, very fancy names. We're not gonna go into them, right? So uh, one of the things we did in the previous stream, we sort of like inverted the algorithm inside out. Right. So let's actually take a look at the uh, at the application cell that we developed in the previous stream. So I think it's located somewhere in Voronoi uh, in here. Right. So we, as you can see, we implemented that in C. So uh, we have uh, some stuff in here. So first thing we do, we initialize the random number generator. Then we fill the image with the background, generate random seeds, and we are rendering the Voronoi. So I'm going to go with the algorithm that is naive. Right, so it will render the Voronoi diagram, then we render the seeds themselves, and then we save the generated image to the PPM file, right? We're actually generating everything in the memory, right? So we allocate a memory region, and uh, we're just like rendering into that memory region, right? So that's what we're doing, essentially. So let me build what we have, all right? And let me try to render that diagram. And if we take a look at the diagram, this is how it looks like, and it does, in fact, look like whatever we saw in, um, in a Wikipedia, so. Right, and uh, one of the things, we, uh, the, the way we did that is essentially we iterated each pixel and for each pixel, we iterated each seed and we found the closest seed and we just call that pixel with the core of that seed. So uh, basically the definition of the of the Voronoi diagram. Another interesting thing I did, I actually inverted the idea of the algorithm. I inverted it. So here we iterate in each pixels, but what I did, I, uh, I started to iterate each seed. And for each seed, I would update the core of all of the pixels. Right. So it's, it's rather an interesting idea, right? So, and essentially, instead of color, instead of color, I'm using the seed itself, right? Seed by itself is a coordinate. It's, it's two coordinates, X and Y. What you can do, you can actually pack them into 32 bits. And since it fits into 32 bits, you can put it instead of a pixel. Right, so essentially I store the coordinates of the seeds in the pixels themselves. 
which allows me to do a very cool thing. I take the first seed and I fill each individual pixel with that seed, like literally using coordinates as the color. Then I take the second seed and I'm start filling in and I only fill in if the new seed that I'm filling in is actually closer to the, to the pixel. Right. So essentially, I store this sort of information in the pixels themselves. It doesn't improve the complexity of the algorithm. The complexity is still uh, something around width uh, multiplied by height multiplied by amount of seats. Right. So it's still uh, roughly the same, but it's actually uh, so it turns it inside inside out. But why exactly did I turn it inside out? Because uh, I feel like when you turn it inside out, it will be uh, it will be easier to port it to OpenGL, right? Because in OpenGL you have a thing called fragment shaders, and fragment shaders allows you to basically write a small program that is executed for each individual pixel. They're, they're called fragments, right? So there is a like subtle difference between fragments and pixels, but uh, for our case, we can consider them pretty much the same thing, right? So, and uh, it allows you to actually do all of that in parallel. So, and what's interesting is that this idea of uh, sort of storing the seed in the pixels themselves and then updating that, um, updating that again with the new seed sounds like a technique called depth buffer. Right, so if you Google up uh, depth buffer, it's a very interesting te uh, technique. So essentially, um, or it's also called Z buffering. It's also called Z buffering. So I'm, I'm gonna put this thing uh, in here in the chat and also in the description, right? So you can find it in here. But the idea is the following, like you render the polygon, right? In 3D space, right? You render the polygon in 3D space, but, um, so maybe I should actually draw that because I think it's something that you want to draw. Uh, like explaining that with your hands is not particularly a great idea. There are some things that you better do with your hands, but explaining with hands not always a great idea. So let me start my paint. Uh, I don't really have a space. Uh, everything is so crammed in here. My God. Uh, finally. So imagine that you are rendering a polygon, let's actually say a triangle, right? A triangle in 3D space. To render that thing in 3D space, you actually need to project it into 2D space, right? So, and as you can see, it's a 3D triangle, uh, but it's, uh, it's actually projected into 2D space. Uh, and essentially what we do when we render for each pixel of the triangle, we actually store the Z value of that triangle, right? So there is a second separate buffer uh, along with the color buffer that stores the colors of the pixels. You have the second buffer, which for each pixels uh, stores the Z coordinate of that pixels based on the projection that we did. So we had 3D space, we projected it into 2D space, and uh, we still have the Z coordinates for each individual pixel in here. And then when you render the second triangle, when you render the second triangle, you know the Z values of this triangle again. And essentially, as soon as you get the Z value that is uh, bigger than the Z value already in the, uh, in the buffer, you actually never render that pixel. You never render it. And this is how essentially the 3D engines achieve the effect where you have two intersecting polygons and you can actually see the line of intersection because the intersect on the level of pixels because we store the Z coordinates on the level of those pixels in a secondary buffer, right? In a depth buffer. So, and uh, here in Wikipedia, you can actually see pretty cool thing where you can take the Z buffer and depending on its value, you can actually color it differently. So the um, sort of closer it is, the more dark it is, and you can sort of get the image of the, of the depth of the entire thing, uh, right? So, and essentially that idea of inverting the algorithm of rendering Voronoi diagram sounds like a Z buffering. It's just like instead of uh, storing the Z value, we're storing the distance to the closest seed. 
So that means we can port that idea to OpenGL using depth buffers. So that's why I inverted it inside out because I got, I basically uh, took these two ideas and combined them together. And I want to actually sort of like see if it will work out or not, right? So does it make sense? Does everything I said make sense? Uh, I think it does make sense. I think it's a really good idea. So I already posted the link in the chat and already put it in here. Um, so <clears throat> uh, let me let me see. Do you guys have any maybe questions? Uh, do you guys have any maybe questions? Mm -hmm. I don't really see any on topic questions to be fair, so I'm gonna assume that everything's clear. Uh, we already know what will work out. Okay, don't don't spoil anything. Okay, don't spoil anything. Uh, all right, so um, let's take a look at the source code. All right, so the way we render this thing right now, uh, render Voronoi, Voronoi interesting. So yeah, I have a function that takes a point and turns it into color, and it fills the entire image with that color. Then, for each individual seed, I take the color of that seed, and I sort of apply it to existing image. Right, and as you can see, what we do here, uh, we take, uh, we sort of unpack that color, then we take the color in uh, the, the seed in the current pixel, and then we compare their distances. So here, I did a very, um, and suboptimal thing, right? I'm using the image, the color buffer, and the depth buffer as the same array, right? So I'm using it as the same array, which is not ideal in my opinion. So we probably want to do something that uh, would correspond to OpenGL, right? So in OpenGL, you would have something like, um, let's say, integer depth, right? Uh, integer depth and uh, we're going to have he uh, height and width so let's actually try to do that let's actually try to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right since we want to store the um, so essentially the closer the uh, seed is if the seed is closer, that means we have to replace the pixel, right? Uh, so that means initially the depth buffer has to be filled with the maximum value possible, right? So it has to be filled with the maximum value possible. Uh, let's go to um, render Voronoi interesting, right? So this is going to be interesting. Let's go here. So first I want to actually sort of like uh, rewrite the algorithm how it would be written in OpenGL with uh, the depth buffer and stuff like that. Uh, right, so let me probably remove this entire thing and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna iterate the entire depth buffer, right. So this is gonna be height uh, and then I'm gonna go x, x width plus plus x and then I'm gonna take an image y x and I suppose you can do max int not init but max int uh, right and let me try to compile that so I'm gonna do build sh um, so I don't quite remember is it int max it could be int max uh, all right int max is in declared it is declared in the header called limits right in the header called limits. Okay. So, and we still say that it's uh, unused, but this is because I didn't really use it properly. Um, okay. So I want to actually see how depth is sort of like filled in, if you know what I mean. Uh, right. But actually, I don't want to print each individual pixel. One of the things I think I'm going to do, right, I'm going to like print the values of those things, right? I'm gonna print the values of those things. Uh, the way we're gonna print them is by print f d. So I'm gonna also put a space in here and it's gonna be depth y and x. And then we're gonna do print f a new line, right? So, and if I try to run this entire thing, it's, it's actually gonna render too many things. And I don't think we care about all of them. So for the sake of simplicity, let's actually make the size of the image like something like 10 by 10. So it's more manageable, so to speak. 
so you know what? I want to run the application every time I build it. I think I'm going to like automatically run it after I build it. I think it makes more sense. Uh, right. So that way, for some reason, it didn't really work the way I wanted it to work because I never actually did it. Okay, so there we go. So we have a 10 by 10 value and these are the values of the depth buffer. So we initialize the depth buffer with the maximum value possible for the value integers. Uh, so Matthew Seth seven seven seven, thank you so much for for the sub. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So now let me let me see. So what we're gonna have? So we filled in everything, right? And the next thing we probably wanna do, we wanna start um, basically filling it up with the distance for the first seed, right? So. We already have a function apply next seed caller. So what I'm thinking is that maybe I'm going to just call it apply next seed. And in here, I'm going to accept uh, something like uh, seed index, right? So this is a seed index, right? And let's actually remove this entire thing. Uh, right, so apply next seed, and this is a seed index. Um, so with the seed index, I'll be able to get the actual seed, right? So this is going to be something like this, seeds, uh, seed index. And then from the index, I can also compute the color because I have a palette somewhere, right? As you remember, probably, I have a palette, right? And uh, I can, based on the index, I can get the palette thingy. So it's a color 32, color, and uh, palette uh, seed index mod palette count. There we go. As you can see, right, the palette count uh, seems to be working. <clears throat> uh, now, now, let's actually iterate through this entire thing. Uh, right, so this is going to be height plus plus y, uh, int x, x width plus plus x. And uh, now, and uh, right, what do we want to do? What do we want to do? We need to compute the distance, right? So the actual distance is going to be like so, dx, uh, x minus seed, uh, seed x, and then we're going to create replace x and y, uh, and there we go. So interestingly enough, uh, we, as I already said, we don't really need to compare the, um, the actual distances. We can always compare the square of the distance, right? So that means I can do the following thing, int d is going to be dx, dx plus dy, dy. Right, and this is where uh, the comparison comes in place. If this distance is less, then whatever we have in the depth buffer for these specific pixels, uh, that means we have to replace that pixel. Right, we have to replace it. So I'm going to do depth y x, we find a better depth, and then for the pixels in here, we're going to replace that with this specific color. Right, so as you can see, it's a, it's a very simple algorithm, right? So we have additional depth buffer, and that's basically it. So let's try to apply the seed number zero. Right, so we're applying the first seed. Uh, and let me see if it actually does anything. So yeah, so it's really unaligned. Maybe one of the things I want to do in here is to sort of like say, okay, uh, pad it with like eight characters. Uh, I think that's a little bit better. Right, so as you can see, this is where the seed is located initially. And those are the distances from the seed to these pixels. Right, so you literally see the sort of like depth buffer technique in here. Uh, right, so, and now uh, what we can try to do, we cannot try to apply the next seed, right, and see how it goes. Uh, so now we should have like two zeros. So here is the first zero and here is the second one. Hopefully you can actually see everything in here. Uh, so we got a rate from Provot. Hello, hello, thank you. Thank you for the rate. Um, right, so 
yeah so here's the first seat here is the second one and as you can see the depths are like this and essentially what we need to do in here is to iterate through all of the seats right so this is going to be zero less than seats count uh, yeah, it's, it's actually constant if I remember correctly, right? And we need to apply each individual seed in here, right? So, and since we have a lot of seeds in here and the resolution is rather small, so we're not going to see anything particularly interesting on such a small resolution. So we need to go back to a bigger resolution, maybe 800 and 600. So we even have like 20 seeds in here. It's like too much for such resolution. And uh, instead of like printing it on in here, we're going to be rendering the seed markers and then we're going to be saving all of that to uh, to the PPM, and if I take a look at the output, here is the output. So as you can see, it worked fine. Uh, it worked fine. So yeah, this is the depth buffer idea. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, we can do um, the demonstration that it actually works. Let's actually render only a single seed. Uh, might as well open the output PPM and how to revert this entire thing so we basically applied only the first uh the first color right then we can apply uh the second color right so here we apply the second color then uh we can apply the third one uh, let me actually do something like this right so this is the thir third one and then the fourth one so this is basically a demonstration of like inverting this algorithm inside out instead of iterating each pixel and then for each pixel iterate each seed we iterate each seed and for each seed we are updating all of the pixels we're updating all of the pixels using the depth buffer using the depth buffer idea essentially uh all right and we can uh, keep going like that right so until we uh, actually take all of the seeds it would be actually kind of nice if the if the seeds were the same so the fact that the seeds are generated differently every time kind of ruins the entire effect so let's actually start over but without uh, like random seeds all the time uh, right so here is the first one then we add another color uh, right as you can see seeds stay the same uh, then it's going to be a uh, third one right so something like this Right, so now we have three, then we have four, uh, then we have five. So we're essentially visualizing the entire process, how exactly we're computing this Voronoi diagram using the depth buffer. Uh, so you can clearly see that. This is, this is actually kind of cool, I really like that. Uh, should have done that right away. So some of the colors kind of collide with each other, but yeah. Yeah, so you can essentially see, and then we can say, okay, uh, just use all of the all of the seeds, and it will just color all of the seeds. Uh, all right, so you can clearly see how this like sort of depth buffer idea works, and as I already said, in OpenGL we straight up have depth buffer, right, and we can essentially move all of these computations to the GPU, right. We, the, our, my idea is to actually move all of these computations that we're doing here to GPU and see if it actually works or not. I know that it's going to work, right? Uh, but I want to explore that on the stream today with everyone. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? The damn complexity of it, it's, uh, it's this. Right. So width and height and the amount of seats. It's a very dumb complexity. Um, am I right that even on the GPU this isn't parallelizable? Why wouldn't it be parallelizable? Since you need to compute each seat in order. The... This for loop is not parallelizable, sure. Even... Well, to be fair, even this for loop is parallelizable. You can actually compute depth buffer you can split seeds in half and you can compute two depth buffers in parallel like first half you you get first depth buffer and second half you get the second depth buffer and then you can combine them together holy shit wait a second can you with additional memory turn this into log s i think you can that's a good question. That's a very good question. I'm pretty sure you can. 
Because with the depth buffer, it is paralyzable. You, you just have several. It's like a merge sword. You essentially turn it into a merge sword with additional memory. So that's so cool. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Uh, maybe I can try that at some point, but yeah. But how many of them do you, do you need to have? It just like depends. Mm -mm. Hmm. Okay. Right. So let's actually port all of that stuff to OpenGL. Right. So before I port it to OpenGL, I think I want to reorganize uh, my project a little bit, just a tiny bit. Uh, so let me rename this thing to something like PPM, right? So, and then uh, we can do ppm.c and this one is a ppm. So, right, it's going to be two separate executables. Uh, and I'm going to introduce main opengl.c. So I'm going to include stdio and uh, we're going to have a main in here and uh, there you go. So maybe I'm gonna say something like um, print hello sailor is kind of already stale. Um, so let's do something like hello seaman. Right. There we go. I think seaman is better than sailor. Uh, yeah. And now. Uh, we need to build this entire thing. So I'm going to do Voronoi OpenGL, right? This one is OpenGL and OpenGL. All right, so then we can try to build this entire thing. Right. As you can see, it has uh, it says hello, Seaman. Uh, okay, so the problem with OpenGL, as you probably know, the OpenGL is, was not designed to be programmed in. Right. No sane human being can learn and understand OpenGL. OpenGL was designed to be copy-pasted. So, and because of that, anyone who ever programmed in OpenGL, like more or less seriously, they usually have some sort of an OpenGL template to sort of speed up the process, right? Because even like to put a simple rectangle on a screen, you need like a couple of hundred lines of code. like. 100 lines of code, several hundred lines of code just to put a rectangle on a screen. This is insanity, seriously. So the OpenGL was not designed for human beings. It was designed to for job security, I suppose. I cannot uh, find any other explanation, but yeah. So I, I have my open OpenGL template, right? So I'm going to put it in here. And uh, for anyone who's interested, I'm going to put that in the description as well. So here is OpenGL template. And we're going to do some pretty epic copy pasting shit, right? So I'm going to just open my template. I'm going to start copy pasting like crazy. So then get scared, right? I'm a professional software developer. I know how to copy paste. In fact, being a professional software developer is all about copy pasting code. Because any professional software developer knows that actually, like truly reusable code is the one that you can take and copy paste to a different place. Not the code that is abstract and OP and decoupled, none of that bullshit. All of that is like ideological bullshit created by the authors of shady books to sell their books, right? Everybody knows that. Actual software, actual professional software developers know that the reusable code is the one that you can take and fucking reuse, right? So... And uh, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do professional software development. We're going to reuse the code. Uh, all right. So let me see. So this is going to be a template. Uh, a template. And uh, let me open uh, that specific template. So we're going to be using uh, GLFW, right? So if you never heard about GLFW, I really recommend to check it out. It's a very simple library for initializing OpenGL, right? Because OpenGL by itself uh, does not standardize the way to create a window, right? So, and, and you can find this library in, in here, right? So, and I'm going to also put this thing in the description as well. Right, so that's the library we use. That's the library we use. Not the library we deserve, 
but the library we use. Okay, so what we need to include in here, we need to include JLFW, right, there you go. And let me try to build this entire thing. So before actually building, um, I need to also link it with the library, right? Uh, I need to link it with the library. Uh, to, to, to. So let's try to initialize the library, right? We try to initialize the library and at the end somewhere we also terminate the library, but I don't feel like we need to terminate it because the operating system is going to deinitialize everything anyway. So who cares to be fair? Who cares? All right, so I'm going to build the entire thing and it already complains about the lack of exit because it doesn't have std lib. Uh, right, I'm going to try to rebuild it. And as you can see, we cannot link it because it doesn't know what the fuck is jlfw. Init, it's a function that just initializes the, uh, the library. And uh, to make it actually find this thing, what we need to do, we need to just link it with jlfw, if I remember correctly. There we go. So in, it actually links. And if we try to run this thing, we already run it. It didn't complain. Right. It didn't complain. Uh, so uh, let's continue copy pasting. How about that? Because we are professional software developers. So the next thing we need to do, we need to hint uh, JLFW what kind of version of OpenGL we want to use. Right. So we're going to use the OpenGL core profile. I also said the major minor version 3.3, .3, but it ends up picking up uh, OpenGL version 4. Uh, it is what it is. I'm not going to complain about that. After that, we want to create a window. Right. So there you go. We created a window. We can try to uh, run and compile this entire thing and as you can see we need to define the default uh, resolution for the window right so the default resolution so i suppose the resolution is going to be uh the usual resolution i use basically 16 by 9 but multiplied by 100 right and as you can see you you saw a blink did you see the blink the screen blinked this is because we successfully created a window, but since we didn't organize the event loop, the application exited and it closed the window, right? And that's why instead of like an actually stable window, we see just a blink, nothing special, right? So the next thing we need to do, we need to uh, organize the event loop, right? Uh, so another thing we're doing here, I just print uh, the version of OpenGL that we picked up, right? So you can only extract that version if you have a window, right? Unless you created a window, you may not know the version of OpenGL that the library picked up for you. But after you did that, you know that the version of OpenGL that we're using is 4.2, right? It's a very useful information, just in case, in my opinion. Right, so um, next thing we have to do, we have to make the context current. Uh, I don't know why you have to do that, and I don't know why none of those uh, functions did that for me, but this is something that I have to use. Okay, the next thing we do, we load OpenGL extensions, and this is because by default they are not loaded, and loading OpenGL extension is a separate unsolved computer science problem. Uh, right, for which people created dozens of libraries. Right. It's, it's really interesting, like OpenGL is supposed to be a cross-platform standardized way of working with like GPU, but it doesn't standardize the way to create a window and initialize OpenGL, and it doesn't standardize the way to load additional extensions. And for all of these two unsolved problems, you have dozens of libraries that do that, some of them compatible with each other, some of them are not compatible with each other, and it's fucking crazy, mate! It's fucking crazy. You're supposed to stand at that shit, uh, but what you did, you actually made the matter worse. It's so worse to the point that I do I need OpenGL? Maybe I could just like directly work with a driver or something. Like you just like why do I have to fucking do that? But anyway, so. <laughs> and uh, there is a lot of uh, libraries that load OpenGL extensions, and I don't like any of them because they're not really solving any useful problems, right? So what I usually do, I just load them myself. Like I have a simple small header, uh, right? A, sm a simple small header where I load only the extensions that I personally care about. Like it doesn't support all 
the possible extensions under the under the sun but it supports the one that uh, I usually used most of the time and if I need additional function it is super easy to add it there you just add additional uh, variable you just add additional line in here and there you go you have a function right and you don't need to have like a separate third-party dependency which introduces more surface for failure you just have a simple header file and I'm happy Right, so that's how I approach uh, loading extensions in OpenGL. Some people may hate it, uh, so I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but this thing works. It works fine for me. So, and it doesn't introduce like additional moving parts that I have to think about, that I have to care about, I don't care, I just want my shit to work. Right, so, and this is a simple file and I'm gonna literally copy paste this file because yet again, reusable code, right? So the reusable code is the one that you can simply copy paste that's right so um and gl xt loader so i think it's just c uh all right so this is just c gl xt loader so that should be fine all righty um so after that uh we essentially check whether we support the uh, draw array instance extension. I don't really care about this extension right now, but there is another extension called debug message callback, and I do care about this extension, so I'm going to check if my current OpenGL library supports that. So after that, I enable some blending. I'm not sure if I care about blending right now, right? It's needed for transparent colors and stuff like that, so I don't care about that. So here comes some bullshit for the, for the template. Right, template comes with its own renderer. I don't care about any of that shit, so I just need a simple, simple thing. So here we set some callbacks for uh, pressing keys and for assigning the windows, so we want to be able to handle those things. I'm going to copy paste that as well. And here, finally, we are organizing a freaking event loop so the window doesn't close automatically. Right. So, because that's the reason why you open the, the window in the first place. You don't want it to close. You don't want it to exist for a while, right? And that's what, exactly what we're doing. So here we're uh, getting the current time and getting the current time is very important to uh, compute the delta time between the frames because each iteration of event loop constitutes a single frame and we need to know the distance, the time distance between the frame so we can animate things accurately. Right. So, and that's why we have the current time, we have the previous time, we, we have the current delta time and stuff like that. Okay, so then we are organizing the event loop and we are iterating until the window should close. Right. So, in the, on each iteration, we constantly take the size of the window and the position of the mouse for some reason. I'm not sure if I care about that, so I'm not going to do that. Then I have uh, calling of different renders and stuff like that. I don't care about uh, that at all. Then uh, we're starting to call uh, OpenGL, right? So here I set with which color to fill the screen and then I say uh, clean the screen, right? So after I clean the screen, I'm gonna swap the buffers because we're using double buffering. So do you guys know how double buffering works? You essentially render into the back buffer and once you're done rendering, you swap the buffers. That way you don't see how the frame is rendered because rendering the frame may take some time and you can literally see how the frame is rendered and it's not creating like a smooth animation. So usually what, uh, you know, graphic systems do, they render everything into the invisible back buffer until it's finished rendering. And only then you show that buffer. So this is called double buffering. So if you, you can read about that on the internet, double buffering. So if you've never heard about that, so I really recommend to check it out. So there's also multiple buffering. You can actually have three buffers, right? So maybe you do multi-threading rendering, right? So maybe you are computing like several frames ahead. I, I never done that before. I'm not sure if people actually do that, but uh, I suppose you can do that. And uh, is, is that the right article I'm looking at? It's just them to hold the block data so that the reader will see. Yeah, just, just Google that, right? So, and after that, we poll the events, right? We poll the events because the window receive events from the user. We, we poll them all. And those events are important for things like should close and handling the keys and stuff like that. So after that, we take the current time and we compute the delta time, right? We compute the delta time. So here is an interesting thing. I also update sort of like, I have the ability to pause animations 
I'm not sure if I care about them in this specific application, so I'm not going to do that. So this is a very simple sort of a template. And as you can see, it's almost 100 lines of code and we haven't rendered anything on the screen. Right. Look how much code I need to write and it doesn't even do anything. It's just like a, you know, border plate. It's just a bureaucracy. Just to, you know, prove to the computer that, yes, I know how to use OpenGL. It doesn't really have any value. All right. So uh, let's actually try to compile this entire thing. And it doesn't even compile. I wrote so much code and this shit doesn't even compile. All right. And so the reason is because I'm trying to set the callback uh, that I haven't copy pasted. Right. So uh, this callback is basically for logging. So this is an extension for OpenGL, which means that if some sort of an error happens in OpenGL, just call this function and we're going to log that error, which is rather convenient for uh, troubleshooting errors and stuff like that. All right, so what else do we have? Uh, key callback. So it's called when you press any keys. So it makes me think, do I really need that? Like, I don't want to handle the keys. If I need to handle the keys, I can add that later. So we're not going to do that. So window resize, again, I'm not sure if I care about that. So I copy pasted it, but then I realized that I probably don't need any of that. So yeah. Uh, all right, so time and the time, I suppose it should be double. I think in the, in the template time was a global variable because I wanted to share between different parts of code. If I'll need to share between different parts of code, I'll make it global variable. For now, it's going to stay local. Uh, all right, there you go. So, and we have some stuff in here. Okay, so it uh, worked. It worked fine, but it cannot link with uh, these functions. It cannot find these functions. And this is because glfw is not OpenGL. It only creates a window for OpenGL to render. You have to link with OpenGL separately. Right, so let's actually go ahead and do that and say on top of linking with GL of W, let's also link with GL. And there you go. After writing, after writing how much of code? So let me, let me see. OpenGL, after writing almost 100 lines of code, we get a window with a red background. Isn't that amazing? That's so fucking great. Holy shit, I love that. It's so fucking great. Anyway. Uh, so. And by the way, I didn't write that code myself. I literally copy pasted it. That's why I said that OpenGL was not designed to be programmed by, hum by human beings. It was not designed to program by human beings. It was designed to be copy pasted. Right, so. All right. Ah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So what we need to do next? We need to actually organize the process of like loading the shaders, right? So uh, let me let me see. In the template itself, we're gonna continue copy pasting. This is only the start, by the way. We haven't finished copy pasting, right? We didn't copy paste everything we need to copy paste. So <laughs> we only started. Now we need to be able to load shaders, compile shaders, and link shaders. Isn't isn't that crazy, right? So essentially, you have a C program that you have to compile. When you run that program that program loads another program, source code of that program, compiles that program, links that program, uploads it on a different device, aka GPU, and starts interacting with it. It actually kind of reminds me uh, web applications in some sense. So essentially, uh, a browser, a web browser, is a client program that uh, asks the server to give it the program to load it on your machine, it loads its program, its client side on your machine, and then can you connect back to the server so they start interacting with each other. So graphics uh, applications are kind of like that. They take client program where client is GPU, they compile that program, link it and upload it to GPU. GPU starts running that program and these two programs on two different devices start interacting with each other, making the graphical application. 
So that's how it works, essentially. <laughs> For some reason, OpenGL applications, like with shaders and stuff like that, kind of reminds me, remind me web application. It's just like um, the server and client are with the same box and it's two different devices, right? So CPU and GPU in some sense. Uh, so, uh, alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Cool. What do I want you to do? Uh, so we need to start like computing shaders and shit. Uh, computing shaders and the shite. Uh, two, 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 two. So we have, as far as I know, there's a link program. Okay, so this is not particularly what I want. Uh, not particularly what I want. Uh huh. All right, all right, all right. So I need to find the function that uh, loads the shaders and it accepts uh, two file paths for the uh, for the vertex and the fragment shader but i don't remember yeah it's called a uh, low shader program right so that's what i have so i have this function right i have this function uh, that accepts two file paths a vertex a vertex file path and a fragment file path and it basically comp uh, loads two shaders compiles them and links them but it's implemented in terms of compile shader file and link program so i'll have to copy paste that as well right so the copy paste uh, copy paste adventures has only started right so this is the compile shader uh, we're gonna put it in here and a link program uh, right we're gonna put it in here as well okay so to compile the shader we need to have a function called slurp file into malloc sister <laughs> Yes, uh, we, we do have such function. Uh, slurp file, let, let me find that function, it's, um, it's somewhere there. Slurp file into malloc system. So you can kind of guess uh, what this function does. It uses go to, by the way, right? So, uh, slurp file into malloc uh, system. So essentially it just loads the entire um, the entire file into memory and it mallocs that memory right so that's basically what it does so slurp file into malloc system so and we also have another function called a compile shader source so this is compile shader file and we have compile shader source which just ac accepts the string so we'll need to copy paste that as well uh, compile shader source uh, all right so i'm going to put this thing in here and we're going to copy paste it like that is this function implemented in terms of anything else i think it is basically the final function which only use opengl right okay so and in here we okay so we also use only opengl i think uh, I think that's basically it. So we need we needed to copy paste. How much code we needed to copy paste to actually load some shaders? Let me see. Right, we needed to copy paste uh, 120 lines of code just to be able to load some text from the hard drive, compile it, link it, and upload it to a different device. So that's how much code we needed. Uh, isn't that great? I think it's pretty great. I really like that. So, and we're already up to 200 lines of code and we still yet don't do anything useful except showing the red screen, which is too harsh in my opinion. So let me actually make it a little bit more dim, right? So, yeah, so we have 200 lines of code. We still don't do anything useful, uh, like at all. Uh, so, okay, this doesn't compile because we need to include some of these things. So this is going to be error now. Uh, what's going to be the next thing? Uh, Boolean. Uh, let's do std bool, right? And uh, what else do we have? Oh, yeah, I have a special function shader type as sisters in case of, uh, you know, printing the error messages, right? In case of printing error messages. So, yeah, so this is needed in case I need to say in which shader the compilation error has happened, right? So that's that's what I needed for. And there you go. We managed to compile it. We, we don't use the copy pasted code yet anywhere. We don't use it anywhere, but uh, at least this entire thing compiled. And it's not as harsh as it was before because we dimmed the red color a little bit. Right. So it complains about some uh, warnings, but this is because it can find STR, STD, um, STR error. So let's actually include string 
and uh, so it also complains about some unused things in here. So I don't want to remove them yet because they can be useful for uh, some animations in the future. Uh, right, 220 lines of code. Very cool, very cool. All right, so now we should be able to load shaders. Uh, now we should be able to load shaders. So we have this function. Uh-huh, uh-huh, so we loaded everything and right before starting the event loop uh, we need to define vertex file path and a fragment file path and essentially initialize a glu int program. There we go. So, and if we couldn't load the program, we essentially have to exit, right? So, as far as I know, load shader program itself already um, prints an error, right? If you try to, yeah, as you can see, it already prints an error for you, so we don't have to print any error. So if we couldn't load the shader program, you just have to just exit and yeah, there we go. So the only thing we need to do, now we need to write the vertex shaders, right? So we'll need to define the path for this one and for this one, okay. So let's create a separate folder where we're going to keep all of the shaders, right? So this is going to be shaders folder. So, and let's see what kind of shaders we can copy paste from the template, right? So we have all sorts of shaders in here. So, and I think the most important shader is probably going to be, uh, going to be quad, right? So this is a very cool shader, which essentially allows you to draw a single quad without introducing any like vertex buffer arrays or anything like that, it basically generates the quad from the GL vertex ID. So essentially, it even explains that, like a single triangle strip quad generated entirely on the vertex shader, simply do uh, GL draw array and say that you want to draw four vertices and the shader generates four points with GL vertex ID and no vertex attributes are required which is rather convenient. So you can just, with this shader, you can say to OpenGL, draw four vertices. And in the vertex shader, it will basically call this program like four times, each time with a different uh, vertex ID. And depending on the vertex ID from zero to three, zero, one to three, we generate four points which form a quad. And we pass it to the to the fragment shader. So we generate in a simple mesh entirely on the GPU, right? And this is exactly what we want to do, right? This is exactly what we want to do. And I'm going to copy paste this uh, vertex shader because it's, it's quite convenient in my opinion. All right. So now we need to do a fragment shader because the vertex shader generates four vertices, right? So they form two triangles. And then when we fill in triangles, we generate a shit ton of fragments. And those fragments have to go through a fragment shader, right? And uh, in a fragment shader, we're going to give those fragments colors. Maybe we're going to do some gradients and stuff like that. And this is where ultimately we're going to update the depth buffer, right? So uh, let me see what we can do in here. So we, we already have a gradient. Uh, yeah. Applies animated um, over time gradient to the user texture. So it accepts time, UV coordinate, and it just like... I think it's a good base, right? I think I think it's a good base, so we can actually copy paste that, uh, right? So we do a lot of useless shit in here, which I probably don't need. I don't need time and the texture. I'm not gonna apply any textures. Uh, so in here, I accept UV coordinates from the vertices. They're probably useful. I also accept color in here, which might be useful, but in the future, not right now. And here we also have the output color, right? So the output color is mandatory. And here we just compute the output color based on the texture and some time and stuff like that. We don't need uh, any of that fancy stuff. So what I'm gonna do in here, I'm gonna just put uh, green color, right? So we already use the red color for the background. I wanna use a different color to check that the shader works, if you know what I mean, right? So cool, we have two shaders. So in here we can, we can actually rename that, so it's actually called color, right? So we have a quad and we have the color. So now uh, what I want to do, I want to go to the OpenGL, all right, to OpenGL and just load both of the shaders, right? So this is gonna be shaders. And the vertex shader is going to be quad uh, vert, quad vert, and in here we're going to have shaders uh, color frag. There we go. 
So let's try to compile this entire thing. And it worked. It didn't really complain about things. So it complained about this like CMD stuff, but it always complained about them. So as you can see, so it's totally fine. All right. Uh, so now we need to actually call that a shader, right? We need to actually call that shader. So as I already said, in the shader itself, we have to do gl draw array, and we have to tell the program that we want to render uh, four vertices, right? We are rendering four vertices, and that should work. That should now change the color to green, and it didn't because this entire thing failed, right? Oh, yes. Of course. <laughs> Ooh. It doesn't make much sense, but you need to create something called vertex array object. Uh, vertex array object. So a vertex array object is just like an object that you have to bound, and it basically describes the data layout for the vertex buffer and we don't use vertex buffer anyway but you have to declare that you're going to have a schema for the data in the vertex buffer anyway because it's OpenGL. there's no reason to do that because like i didn't use vertex buffer and i'm probably never going to use them throughout the entire stream but you have to create that because it's open gl it's designed to be a pain in the ass you're supposed to suffer you're supposed to suffer for everything that you don't use. You're just supposed to do that for the name of flexibility. Flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Do, do you feel the flexibility throwing through you, flowing through your veins? Yes. All of that suffering is for the name of flexibility. Anyway, so uh, let me let me actually do that. So what do I need to I, I want to create a vertex array object. Yes, that's right. Um, let me let me see so basically we have vao right and we created by g like calling these two functions like literally what i have to do i just call these two functions and that's it uh so i'm gonna do that before i load the program uh, glu in vao and that is literally it so i just had to add the three additional lines of code right three additional lines of code and there you go so at least it doesn't uh, complain about shit anymore which is kind of cool isn't it right but it doesn't render anything <laughs> so <laughs> i really like that so uh yeah we fixed the error but uh we don't know what, what happened and why it doesn't uh, doesn't render shit anymore which is which is rather interesting and you know why because i just put this line in the wrong place i have to do that here right so uh, still doesn't work. Still a miss. Okay. So let's go into the fragment. Uh, wait. Shader. Uh, cola. Right. The output color has to be this, and it seems reasonable, right? So I don't know why it would be like that. Uh, what about the quad? Um, in the quad, it also seems reasonable, so I didn't see any problems in here as well. Uh, yep, 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 yep. It just like doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't want to work for whatever reason. For whatever reason. So you see, you spend so much time uh, copy pasting this entire thing, and it doesn't even fucking work. Isn't that amazing? I think it's freaking amazing. So I wonder, do I even? Oh, I don't. I don't even use it anywhere. Oh, Jesus Christ! Use program, uh, program. There you go. And finally, holy shit! You know, the, the funniest thing is that I didn't even write that code myself. Like I literally copy pasted already existing code, and I still had like a terrible time. I still had a terrible time, and all for the sake of flexibility. It's, it's the price of flexibility. You don't understand, Zos, and that's the flexibility. Fucking bad. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in Vulcan, by the way, you have even more flexibility, which means you have even more suffering for things that you don't use. Uh, so. 
I do it from scratch every time to increase my madness, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't didn't do it from the scratch, but I already gone completely fucking mad. Um. <clears throat> Mm, 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 mm. Uh, so we have a look at the open gel dsa i don't know i don't know what the dsa let me actually see dsa direct state access looks like yet another standard to be fair i i kind of want to take a look at leap dri at some point uh so essentially it's um did i call it correctly i think yeah it's it's a framework so it's essentially like opengl but it's a lower level for linux right so e opengl like a mesa opengl on linux is implemented using uh direct rendering rendering infrastructure right so i kind of i'm kind of interested in that idea because essentially by, by using that you so the only reason why you use opengl is cross-platform ability Right. So that's the only reason. That's and all of the suffering you have is because look, for the name of cross platform ability as well, as well as flexibility and some other things. So what if I say, okay, what if I want to create like a 3D application and I want it to be a Linux exclusive? I want it to be a Linux exclusive thing. Okay, so that means I don't need OpenGL, right? Uh, I can use whatever the Linux specific thing uh, offers, right? And I can learn this thing. And then I can say, okay, so I really like this application. And what if I create my own abstraction? What if I create my own abstraction? So, and behind that abstraction on Linux, I would use the uh, DRI. And on Windows, I can use Direct 3D. And on um, Mac OS, I can use Metal or something like that. So I think it's an interesting rabbit hole to go into just to explore. Uh, yeah, because I think it's it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Because I want to see what's below, right? OpenGL is like a layer, right? But what's below that layer, at least on Linux, right? You know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? So I think it's going to be interesting. And also on top of that, uh, it could be an interesting topic for the stream, right? Uh, thank you for showing me this. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, so definitely check it out. I haven't checked it out myself, so I'm also curious what it's all about and what it can offer. So I do not expect it to be easier than OpenGL, right? But the thing is, there uh, like DRI doesn't need to confer, confer, confront confront any standard it doesn't have to fit in any standard so they can uh basically expose whatever they can conform yeah conform thank you thank you so much uh so they can just like use whatever interface they want right even the one that is suitable for specific job in OpenGL, you just don't have any choice right so you just like have to be this interface and that's it so here's the box you have to fit into, into that box so i feel like hypothetically in dri um, you have even more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially that line on Wikipedia that says the array implementation is scattered throughout the X server. Oh boy, <laughs> that doesn't look promising. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So again, I haven't tried it, so I don't know. Maybe it's as terrible as OpenGL. Um, OpenGL is not a box, it's a hypercube. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so, what we need to do, what we need to do, uh, we need to do the uh, depth buffer, right? So let's actually Google up OpenGL depth buffer. Let's take a look at the depth buffer. So on Learn OpenGL, uh, there is a pretty cool tutorial about uh, depth buffers and stuff like that. So you may want to take a look at that. Right, so I'm going to put it in the chat and I'm going to put that in the description uh, for anyone who's watching on YouTube. If I ever going to upload this thing on YouTube, I don't know, maybe uh, the world is going to get lost in history and, uh, you know, nobody's going to see that ever. 
Uh, so as I already said, depth buffer is additional buffer along with the color buffer. So it's like similar to what we implemented on CPU, right? So if you take a look at here, right, so we have the color buffer where we store the pixels and we create additional parallel buffer uh, to store the depth, right? So, and that's literally what OpenGL does if you enable gel depth test, right? And what's interesting is that we usually clean the color buffer by providing gel color buffer bit, uh, right, but then you have all sorts of buffer that you, you that you can clean, right? So uh, if you introduce the depth buffer, you also have to clean the depth buffer. Um, okay, so let's actually enable the depth test. Uh, so open GL. Let me let me see. So here we do that. I'm gonna create right before I create VAO, right? So this is gonna be the depth test. And GL clear, right? So here should have. I should have actually put this thing before gel clear color. Maybe I'm not really sure. But anyway, so here we clean the color buffer, right? And then I can say gel uh, depth buffer bit. There we go. So and that thing will also clean the depth buffer. So and how can we store any information in the depth buffer? How can we store any information in the depth buffer? So the information. Uh, into the depth buffer usually comes from the z axis of gel position of the vertex shader right so that's why we have z axis because you have like 3d uh, meshes right and you process these 3d meshes using the vertex shader and uh so the open gel offers you a way to automatically compute the depth buffer values based on this z uh, coordinate of the vertex right but what's interesting is that um we have a very unique situation when this thing is not really going to be helpful right so to speak let me actually show you why so it's 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 going to produce really weird results and it's just like not going to work so essentially you want to draw like a quad right so and oh, let's put it this way so let's imagine that this side of quad is closer to us then this side of quad so it goes into like you know further so that means the z values of these fragments are going to be smaller than the z values of these uh, fragments right so basically the z values uh, go from smaller to uh, to bigger and this is how exactly the depth buffer is going to be filled in filled in automatically based on the coordinates of the vertices right but we have a slightly different situation. We want to draw a quad of the size of the same uh, of the entire screen, and we have a seed, and what we want our depth values to increase from this point. You cannot come up with the z values for this quad to actually make it work. You just cannot, right? It's just like whatever you rotate, whatever you put Z values, you're not going to get the situation when uh, you have a point in the middle of the quad and the Z values just increase in, in the radius, in, in a circle. You, you just cannot do that, <laughs> at least in the vertex shader. So because of that, like this kind of Z value is use, useless for us, right? So we can't really do that on the vertex shader. So what we're going to do, we're going to just like leave this Z value as it is. But luckily, Luckily, in vertex shader, right? If you take a uh, in the fragment shader, I'm sorry. Uh, along with like output cover, right? You also have GL frag depth, right? GL frag depth, and it establishes a depth value for the current fragment. So available only in fragment language, uh, frag depth is an output variable that is used to establish the depth value for the current fragment. If depth buffer is enabled and blah, 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 uh, the fixed value for the depth uh, will be set. So essentially, in a nutshell, you can literally just set gl frag depth to whatever you want. And it's going to be written into the depth buffer for that specific pixel. Uh, and But we need to know the seed itself. We need to know the seed itself. Uh, so I suppose we can just pass the seed uh, as a uniform. Right. We need to pass the seed as the uniform. Right. Do we need anything else? 
Do we actually need anything else? We probably also need a color, right? So uniform vec for color, right? So, and the way we're gonna render all of that, we're gonna basically render n quads of the size of the entire screen, n quads of the size of the entire screen, with different seeds and different colors. And we're gonna compute the, uh, the depth accordingly to the seed. Right. What's interesting is that if, uh, on top of seed, we also need to know the coordinates of the current fragment. We can actually take them from here. So we have a frag chord x, y. The thing we need to do, we need to find the distance between the current coordinate and the seed. And essentially, uh, put it in here. That's it. Believe it or not. It's, it's literally what we do, but on, on, CP, uh, on CPU. Uh, all right, let me let me actually see. So interesting. Uh, all right, so apply next seed, and this apply next seed is basically the uh, that shader, right? So as you can see, we'll set the depth to the uh, to the length, right? And we set the image to to the color, right? If the depth actually you know checks out. Uh, all right, so let me go to the fragment. But as far as I know, frag depth has a certain range. It's something like from zero to one, but I don't quite remember what's what's the range of this thing. Uh, right, gel frag depth, gel frag depth uh, range, gel frag depth range uh, should be from zero to one. Okay, so this one is a little bit complicated, right? So essentially. The frag coordinate x, y is in the screen coordinates, right? And we need to take that distance from a seed and frag fragment uh, and normalize it from 0 to 1. Which begs the question, what is the maximum length we can have by which we have to divide this entire thing? Um, let's take a look. So if this is a screen, right, if this is a screen, uh, zero, zero starts here, the maximum length uh, we can have is probably this diagonal, right? It's, it's the maximum length you can have, like, at all, uh, which means that we need to know the resolution of our screen, right? So we don't really know it in, uh, in here, but we can pass it as a uniform as well. Uh, right, we can say, okay, here is the resolution. Right, so we'll have to pass uh, at least three uniforms now. So, and then we can just divide this thing by the resolution. There you go. So that should be it effectively. And as I already said, since we have the customizable color, we're gonna put the color uh, in here, right? Mm -hmm. So now what we need to do is uh, essentially just pass all of the necessary information to the uniforms, right? So we need to pass all of that information there. Uh, so to pass all of that information there, we need to find the locations of those uniforms, right? So where do we load the program? Uh, let me try to do that. Uh, open, uh, open GL, I don't remember. Open GL docs, does anyone remember what's a, it's a docs GL, there we go. It's a dogs JL. Uh, JL get uh, uniform uniform location. Right. So let's actually go to JL three. Uh huh. Uh huh. And let's put that thing in here. Uh -huh. This is a program, and this one is going to be what? So what kind of uh, uniforms we have in here, right? So we have resolution, color, and seed, right? And I'm gonna do the following thing where I just declare a variables and I'm gonna also indicate uh, that they are uniforms. So I'm gonna just pair them with you because why not? So gel get uh, uniform location program and we have to provide the name. Right, so we're gonna put those names in here and we have those things, right. Uh, might as well print them. So since uh, we don't use all of them, I think we use all of them. So here we use seed, resolution and color. That means they're not gonna be optimized out, right? So that's fine. Uh, so let me do the following thing, right? So 
So what I want to do is just print those mother flippers, right? So I'm going to just copy paste that stuff. D, uh huh, and cool. Because I want to see if we manage to to find them, if we manage to load them, and stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, we managed to find them. So zero, one, two, resolution, color, and seed. Cool. Now. Before doing the draw arrays, before doing the draw arrays, I probably want to set the resolution. So to set the resolution, I need to know the size of the screen, right? Uh, so I think I can simply set it once. GL uniform to F uh, U resolution default screen width default uh, def default screen height screen width and screen height so then in here i can do gel uniform u seed and let's put that seed somewhere at the center of the screen right so this is going to be at the center of the screen uh, this one is going to be height all right and in terms of the color let's set some color there as well gel uniform uh, 4f right so this is gonna be u color maybe we need to come up with like a random u or random color or something like that but uh... so let's come up with the random float right random float random float and this is gonna be just one uh right and random float is essentially gonna be from zero to one just like in uh, in JavaScript, right? So this is a random float. And here we're gonna simply take a random, absolutely random value, turn it into float and divide it by uh, rand max. I think it's rand max, or maybe it's a max rand. I can never remember, but the compiler will tell me if I'm doing something wrong, for sure. Um, okay. So, uh, two, 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 two. so this is a random color, but here's an interesting thing. So I suppose it's going to be different on each frame. So let's actually do a simple trick where I can do a rand and just put zero in here, right? So the, uh, the result of these random values is going to be deterministic anyway. So who cares? Um, oh, by the way, which also means I can use this thing, I can just like generate a random point on the screen by doing something like this. I, I can do that, yeah. yeah, 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 I can do that. There we go, so we're generating random seed on the screen, we're generating random color, and we're doing one single draw call. Let's see what's gonna happen, and this is a first thing. Here is an interesting stuff. Uh, if we do that the second time, Right. If we do this draw call the second time, we're going to generate a new random value with a new random color. And the fragment shader should kick in. And depending on the distances with the seed, it should actually, uh, you know, combine two sort of surfaces together. So we have two seeds and we combine them together using the... Um, the depth values, right? So let's actually put that in a loop, right? So because it will make it easier for us to increase those values, right? So uh, let's say size uh, zero less than, um, so we have two, let's actually put three. What if we try to render three of those surfaces? Right, so what's gonna happen? Um, doesn't look that bad. Uh, what about you know, four of them. So this is four of them. And what about 10? So we essentially generating Voronoi diagram uh, on the GPU. So effectively what we're doing, we have N surfaces. N surfaces, e each frame by the way. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing that each frame. We're generating a new Voronoi diagram each frame. So we have, for each seed, we have a single surface, which is quad of the size of the entire screen, right? We have 10 seeds, so we render 10 quads, right? And we render them at the same z-axis. And in the fragment shader, we resolve the, uh, you know, the z-fighting 
uh, in favor of the one that has the closest seed for that specific pixel. So effectively what it is, it's a very controlled, precisely controlled Z fighting. Do, do you guys know what is a Z fighting? Uh, Z fighting. So you've probably have seen that in, in 3D games. It's when two, like several polygons are like have the same coordinate, right? So the same in the same plane and their pixels, their fragments start fighting with each other like on um, on who's gonna be visible. So we essentially have like N quads, each with the same Z, so their fragments start to fight with each other, but we control that fight, we control that fight to generate the Voronoi diagram, right? So that's basically what we're doing. So it's, it's a controlled Z fighting, effectively. Uh, right. Uh, and it's rather fast. So what if we try to generate hundreds of them? So maybe uh, it actually slows down, but it generates like 100 of them. Um, but what if we want to animate that? What if we want to make the seeds move around? Oh. Ooh. 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 Okay, so, but I'm a little bit tired, so we'll have to make the uh, a small break first. <clears throat> so, does anyone have any intuitive questions? Uh, read. <clears throat> German people fighting? Oh, is he fighting? <laughs> okay. Is he fighting? It's not the fighting, it's a Z fighting. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Just looking through like for for some questions in the chat. Uh, next episode of Sodium Voronoi diagram diagrams with FPGA. I don't have FPGA and I have an opportunity to buy them. I'm sorry, and I also don't have an opportunity to rent them. I don't have any opportunity at all. Mm -mm. Okay, you can have multiple primitives generate fragments that write different Z values to the depth buffer and they are a result with the gel depth function. I, I know that. Okay, thank you for telling me that. I know that. Okay. Uh... Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right. So let's make a small break. Uh, Olixi Lisovi, I hope I pronounced you correctly. Thank you so much for a tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, so let's make a small break and you guys have fun. All right, let's continue. So what I want to do, I want to actually pre-generate uh, these sort of like random seeds and random colors and uh, put them somewhere in a memory buffer, right? So um, I think I'm going to copy paste some code from the PPM uh, thingy as well. Right, as you can see here, we have a seeds count and I'm going to put this thing in here. Um, right. So, and we have a point, but the, the point here is actually integers. So I want to create a different point, uh, which is going to be a bunch of floats. Type struct, maybe I'm going to call it vec2, right, so maybe vector2. Uh, float x y because this is what it's called in in J. So I kind of got used to that. Mm, all right. So and we need to introduce the seeds. Uh -huh, here are the seeds, and this is a vector two electric boogaloo. In terms of the colors, in terms of the colors, so we'll have to think. I kind of like the groove box palette. Um, but I don't think, yeah. So to, to actually use the groove box palette, I have to spend some time converting this course to uh, to floats and stuff like that. And I don't really want to do that. So I'm going to just generate random colors this time. So we have vector four and it's a Z, uh, ZW, right? And static vector four colors, right? So it's going to be seeds count. Uh, maybe it should be called seed colors, right? So we have seed, uh, seed colors and seeds position. Maybe uh, I should call it positions, right? So we have seed, uh, seed position and seed colors. Cool. So we have these two buffers, 
and let's generate this stuff. We have generate random seeds, right? Not seeds, not not seeds, but seeds. Is there like a significant difference difference in pronunciation? Like I, I guess it's like T and D in one case, in in, in different cases. Okay, seat uh, positions, and this one we're gonna use random float multiplied by default uh, default screen width, right? So then we have uh, seat positions y uh, random float multiplied by default screen uh, height. Right, default screen height. So. And another thing we probably want to do is to generate a random color, right? So we're going to have seed colors, I, uh, X, uh -huh. one, two, three, four. Should have actually removed that uh, thing in here. Um, y, Z, W, right? So as you can see, here is a random position within the screen and uh, a random color, well, it doesn't have to be multiplied by height, right? It has to be a value from zero to one. Okay, that is very cool. Uh, now, uh, we are gonna call this entire thing right before everything else, right? We're generating random seeds. Uh, and then instead of like generating them on the fly, uh, we're gonna just like use pre-generated things, right? I think it makes sense, right? So here we have seats uh, count, right? So this is a seats count, and for the seat we said seed uh, positions i x, uh, seed positions i y, and for the color. Um, we're gonna do, well, th this is rather interesting, right? This is rather interesting because this one doesn't have to be random. Let's actually put it to one, right? So this is gonna be just one. Um, so we seed colors, I, eh, X, and I'm gonna just put it like this. So it's gonna be Y, eh, Y, Z, W. There we go, cool. Mm, might as well do something like this. All right. As I already mentioned, all of these things are pre-generated, right? They are pre-generated and let's see. Uh, so that's fine. Let's actually try to make it moving. So to do that, we'll also need to have things like velocities, right? So we have to do static vector two seed uh, velocities, right? So seed velocities seeds uh, count, right? Generate random seeds, <coughs> excuse me. Oh my. And uh, so for the velocity, we need to generate like a random angle, right? We need to generate a random angle. Uh, so let's do the following thing. It's going to be a random float multiplied by two multiplied by pi, right? So it's going to be a random value from zero to two pi, right? So and after that, we can say seed velocities i. Uh, x is going to be, so x is a cosine, right, cosine for that random angle, and y is going to be sine uh, for that random angle, right. So, and we also need to have some sort of a magnitude, right, some sort of a magnitude, and it's going to be a random value from one thing to another, so we can maybe lerp this thing, so the minimum uh, velocity is going to be 100 pixels, the maximum is going to be 500. We, we can do something like that. So let's actually call it lerp, right? And that's what we're going to have. And we're going to multiply those things uh, by the magnitude. Right. Uh, no, tau. Tau versus pi is like literally spaces versus uh, tabs of mathem mathematics. It's literally the same level of discourse, like seriously. Tau versus pi is like literally the same level as tabs versus spaces. So, <laughs> um, anyway. <clears throat> uh, do I have pi? Uh, I think I don't have pi. So I'm gonna copy paste this thing somewhere. Uh, define, I think it's like, there is something like mpi, right? So in some of the, in some of the cases, so I'm gonna just like stick with that. Let's try to compile this into I think. And it's of course not gonna compile because I have a couple of errors, but that's the point. I want my program to fail. 
uh, mpy. Is it available? Where is it available? It should be available in math, right? But I don't include math. What if I include math? Is it gonna work? It actually kind of works. But we don't have lerp, right? So, and it's kind of a shame that uh, in C you don't have those things. So let's actually put to implement that. Uh, linear interpolation. Uh, so we take the distance between A and B and we just do that and then we offset it back by A. There we go. Uh, what else do we have? And we also need to link with the math library, right? So we're already linking with three libraries, GL of W, GL and math. All right, so what else do we have? Everything seems to be working, everything seems to be twerking, but now uh, we need to be able to update those things as well. How are we going to be updating them? So we have that at the time. Uh, the way we're going to work with all of that. So we're going to compute the next x value of the seat, right? So seat position uh, ix plus seat velocity multiplied by delta time, right? So this is the next position of x. And if x is within uh, the available range, the, the allowed range, so to speak, uh, default. Uh, that means it's going to be the new position. It's going to be the new position of the seed, right? If it goes outside of the allowed range after this modification, we're not going to make it a new position. Instead, we're going to invert the x component of the velocity so it goes in the opposite direction right so and we're going to repeat that for y coordinates as well right so here we're going to have actually this one has to be x right and this one also has to be x and i'm going to replace x with y right so in here we also replace x with y but also with with height and the same goes like this so as you can see we do this process on both of the coordinates so that way they're gonna like bounce off of the uh, off of the borders and never go outside of the borders because if they try uh, their velocities are gonna be reversed right so sort of like a prevention mechanism by the way i developed this technique this is actually a very robust way of, comp of implementing very simple physics of bouncing off of the borders and other obstacles. And I developed this mechanism, very simple mechanism, while I was working on Jailbreak. Jailbreak literally uses that algorithm for all of the collision detections and all of the physics, like literally for everything, including particles, the balls, like everything uses that simple algorithm and it produces cool results without like too much of the like stacking. Uh, except for the particles, but uh, overall, it's it's actually a very powerful technique, right? So you don't need any like separate physics library to get this result. You can get this result by just doing this for literally everything. So it's kind of cool. Of course, I'm not saying that uh, it fits for any kind of physics, but for very simple one, it's actually very robust and very cool. Mm. All right, so let's see if it actually does anything, right? <clears throat> uh, to, to. Holy shit, this is so cool. What the fuck? <laughs> I love that. Look at him go. Look at this motherfucker go. Yo. <laughs> And it's so fast. I mean, it's just like, I won't be able to do that on CPU for sure. Like, holy fuck, it's so cool. Uh, what do I have more of them? Um, okay, okay, so 13. What about 13? Uh, it's so dope. But I'm pretty sure if I do 100, it's gonna like just kill the stream. It's not as bad, but I mean, it's just like frame rate is dropping. So we're probably not gonna do that. Uh, we can try to, um, um, I suppose, try first move uh, all of the data to the GPU. So this is two seats, by the way. This is two seats. Uh, right, but 10, 10 of them is actually kind of cool. I really like that. This is really cool. Uh, cup of pride indeed. 
Uh, why not render the seeds? Because you have to spend extra time and create like extra shaders to render the seeds. And this is something that I don't really want to do right now. So yeah, that's why I didn't render them. Mm -hmm. Well, you can kind of try. Maybe not. That's a good point. Let's actually try to come up with the um, with shader idea. Hmm. So essentially, essentially, if the uh, length, right, if the length between the current coordinate and the seed is less than the seed marker radius, uh, we are going to uh, put output color, output color as the seed. Uh, marker color. Otherwise, otherwise we're going to do that. Interestingly, uh, we want to do that regardless of the depth, right? So essentially, if we want to render the depth marker, we always want to make it visible. So that means we're going to set the gel frame depth uh, depth to zero, right? So if this thing is less and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's actually set uh, seat marker radius. We're gonna say it's gonna be like around maybe five, 10 pixels, right? So the color, uh, the color, mm, let's say to um, maybe 18, it's gonna be one, okay. Yeah, there we go. So you can you can actually see them now. Yeah, thank you, thank you for for suggesting that. Like, uh, I thought that is going to be difficult. In fact, it was not difficult at all. It was actually easier than I thought. I can do that in the fragment share. Uh, yep, that's pretty cool. So we can maybe make it a bit darker, all right? So it's going to be just one. Uh, now they're really visible. Mm hmm. And maybe it's going to be five. <clears throat> uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, I think I kind of like ten because they're more visible. Mm -mm -mm. Interestingly enough, I think we can maybe invert the colors instead of having like a seed. Right, we can, we can try to do that. I can do vector 4. And how do you invert the colors? We can try to do it minus 1, uh, color x. Maybe I can like literally do minus 1, uh, color. Is that something I can do? Yeah. So now they're using like opposite colors, but it's not particularly visible that well. So yeah, let's go back. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I think that's basically everything that I wanted to do, right? So I finally achieved, achieved what I wanted to achieve for quite some time already. I wanted to like render Voronoi diagram in real time on GPU and like move those things around and stuff like that. So this is something that I wanted to do for quite some time. And this is so cool that I can finally do that. So does anyone have any on topic, preferably on topic questions? Preferably on topic questions. We build SH. Let's actually increase the amount of things. Yes, 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 yes. Can you try with the Manhattan distance? Sure. Uh, let me see. To do that, we'll have to update the shader. The Manhattan distance, the classic, the classic. So, as far as I was just like. Uh, uh -huh. It's like you take the it's difference be between the axis. So let me say vector two a. So this is that, and then we have a seed. So float d x is a x minus seed x d y y y. 
Right, and here I just do dx plus dy. I think this is the Manhattan distance, right? So if I remember correctly. And because of that, the Manhattan, the maximum of the Manhattan distance is basically this. Right, something like that. Though I'm not sure why I am like have a separate things in here. I can just do gl frag quorum. Right. Ooh, let me see. There we go. Oh, we can't see shit in this mist. Um, it, it has to be absolute values, right? So we have to take the absolute values of those things, right? Uh huh. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. It works with the Manhattan distance as well. Look at that. That's so cool. <laughs> it doesn't really look. It's 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 a bit jumpy. Uh, it's a bit jumpy, but it works nonetheless, right? It does look like a Voronov with Manhattan distance, yes. Uh, it looks like a metro map. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. So we can try to do. Can can we have a? Do we have a power? Yeah, we do have a power. So that means I can do something like this and then write it to the power of uh no we have to do it like that uh -huh. and then uh write, write this to the power of one divided by three right so that's what we need to do uh our x resolution x replace x y i'm gonna divide it could become a bit slower to the fair uh -huh. oh so that's fine mm. Not bad. P norms. Mm. <laughs> All right. So you can increase to four. I, I think after three, it doesn't really make much difference. If I remember correctly. Uh, R X R Y four. Yeah, it doesn't make much difference. So it it, it all looks like norm, like uh, three norm. Uh, but yeah, with with four norm, it's just the same. Though maybe maybe it kind of be, it feels like it becoming it's becoming smoother. If you know what I mean, right? It feels like it's becoming smoother. Uh, I definitely should make it more generic so I can just update the P, right? And it would compute that automatically for me. All right. No, it doesn't look that different, right? So the, the most interesting results are that uh, when you have two norm, right? One norm, two norm, and three norm. After three norm, everything looks like a three norm. So at least like, you know, visually. Right, um, okay, does anyone have any other on-topic questions? Uh, can you implement the dynamic in GPU? The dynamic, you mean the velocities, updating velocities on GPU? Uh, well, the same movement, probably not. Um, Mm -mm. but maybe something else right because I, here i'm just updating the position based on the velocity so that means i need to maintain a state somehow so uh, i can change just like dy dynamic movement somehow right? i can make them move slightly differently maybe even add some um i don't know i can make the points like move in a circle then within the circle i can add some sine waves so with sine waves i can sprinkle a bit um randomness with a random number generator and then uh basically make all of that animated based on time 
or something like that. I can try to do that, but that sounds like another half of an hour of work, right? And I don't really have much time for that. So yeah, I can probably move all of the dynamic movement to GPU as well and like do everything with the GPU and the input parameter for the GPU is just time, right? So, and the entire movement is deterministic based on time. Maybe it is possible, but it's just like too much. Time. I don't really have time for that. Mm. Uh, I just arrived, may I ask you if you compute that in C or in shader? I compute all of that in shader. So on C, I only compute the positions of these uh, dots, of these seeds, uh, all of the pixels, like the actual, uh, you know, borders of these cells is computed entirely on the GPU using depth buffers, right? So I store intermediate uh, information for, for the colors in a depth buffer and I just use that in the depth buffer. So majority of the stuff you see is computed on uh, GPU. On a CPU, we compute only the positions of these points, but even that can be probably moved to GPU as well. Uh, <clears throat> so does anyone have any other questions? Does anyone have any other questions? I guess that is maybe it, all right? I guess that's it for today. Let's maybe raid somebody. Uh, how about that? So I haven't raided anyone for quite some time. People keep raiding me, but I don't raid anyone back because I have an old CPU, right? I have an old CPU, uh, which does not support Twitch. <laughs> oh. mm, all right. So do we have anyone? Do we have any OpenGL programmers on Twitch to raid? Mm. So this is the this is how fast uh, it works on my machine. Uh, Jessica Mag, Jessica, she actually raided us some time ago, so I think we should raid her back. Of course, Jessica, Jessica Mag, she's actually doing very cool game. Uh, I really recommend to check it to check it out. Uh, it's not out yet, but I mean to check the stream out. So let's do the raid. Um, so unfortunately. It, it types very, very slowly. I wish I could just pause my stream so it does not consume too much resources. Uh, Jessica Mac. All right. Uh, so I send the command. It doesn't show anything up here. Now it is slowly showing. All right. Okay. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, love you all. Love you all. See you next time.